So this is episode 13 of Cup of Chi, Ow. and I'm here with a friend, Tierra Owen, who um, runs a business called Nursing Ourselves, has been involved in the medical world for, I'm not going to say because they'll give the game away, but she's okay. been she was in for, for a while, um, and now she is helping other people in the medical establishment nourish themselves, and other people are you know, like me and other people help them to overcome any difficulties in their life and to help them find strategies to help nourish their life. So Tierra, over to you. Can you give the audience a little brief history of time of where you were and how you got here and what you're up to at the moment? Yeah, thank you. And I think pretty soon it's going to be more than me. I just heard the bus pull up for my son to arrive home from school. Um, so uh, I I want to thank you first for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's really always great to talk to you and have a wider audience to listen in if they want to. And um, I think 13 is a lucky number for me. So I love that as well. Um, so let's see. Um, I have a pretty um, long history of working with birthing women. That's really where I started my second career <laughs> after farming and, and gardening for, for many years, which was a difficult toil to make ends meet. But um, starting back really from when I was 12 years old, I had a very strong calling to to um, start to explore birth and what birth was all about. And I think it really connected me to my um, wild woman archetype, really. It really started that exploration for me being on that preteen end of things to look at um, how I may want to develop my life and how I may want to express myself through having children or not, but certainly to look more into that as that was sort of my um, biological um, viewpoint. And so um, it took me through turns and twists and um, what I ended up um, doing was exploring further um, when I um, met the the father of my first child and um, got to have the real down home experience of just doing it myself. And, um, and through that was it just an incredible gift of knowing and understanding myself at a deeper level that I really wanted to share that with, with other people. Um, so journey on there from another six or seven years, I went to nursing school, um, and, um, did some doula work in between, um, also attended and assisted home births, um, and then finished nursing school and began working, um, at a local hospital, local small hospital. And this is my youngest kiddo, Emerson. Hey, Emerson. <laughs> Um, He's not so small anymore, eh? No, he actually just reached my height. Um, um, okay, that's fine. Um, about uh, three days ago. So we've been, so my youngest has uh, sailed the ship of having any small children. <laughs> my, my Scott, as you know, Scott, he's 13 so and he's six foot. He's oh like six foot. Like he's, oh my God. like I'm 5'10". He's like, it's. You know, and yeah, he doesn't that seem ship to start. That sailed for you as well. <laughs> I feel like the little person. I feel like how my dad used to feel when I walked up to him. <laughs> <laughs> and they love it, don't they? Oh, they love it. Yeah, he likes the pat. The little daddy. He does my bald head. He just pats on my bald head. The little daddy. They're there. You know, <laughs> the cheek is is rife with these teenagers. You know. Oh. That's so great. So I worked in the hospital for um, about 20 years and um, and I'm just sort of arriving on the other side of that. I retired my position um, November 1st of 2021. Um, and um, the last three or four years of working in the hospital, I developed um, my own business called Nursing Ourselves, which you mentioned. And a big, strong offshoot of that, especially during COVID, was Birthing Ourselves which is that ability to not only get the education um, and, and the coaching that you need around giving birth, but also to recognize that inherent aspect that as you give birth as a mother, you also birth yourself. Um, and so um, becoming and stepping into that role has really been um, sort of the focus of, of, of my post-retirement um, efforts to work and move forward. 
I don't think you'll ever retire. Be, I, <laughs> I retired tell. from the hospital. You're a Sagittarius, so we just we've got fire in our bellies, you know. We don't stop. So right. I have a student actually. She's over in the Czech in in Czech. We just call it Czech now. Oh, um, okay. And she so dearly wanted to be a midwife, you know, when she was young, and then she got into the corporate thing which she's really good at and she's really good at marketing and she became a ninja in marketing and stuff mm -hmm. uh, and then she found me in chinese medicine and now she's loving working with pregnant women so it's kind of come you know sometimes there's that calling there it's just not always delivered in the way you think that you want it it's delivered in the way that actually universe needs you to be and it's, uh, I think she's beginning to kind of realize that now. Yeah. Um, like my wife, I think she really would have loved to have been a vet, but then when she sees what a vet has to do, she's like, actually, no, not really. You know, it, it's quite a tough, can be quite tough and quite heartbreaking. So yes. it's knowing, it's knowing where you sit. So, so you've had this career as a farmer working with your hands and then delivering babies with your hands and now helping people deliver their own lives back to themselves. And what do you spend? What sh I mean, because I remember seeing videos of you doing a little bit of functional strength training. Yeah. I know you've been doing the Qigong with me and other people. Um, what's his name? Um, I can't remember his name. The, the guy you were doing a training course with. Uh, Jonathan Peng, is it Peng or I can't remember. Oh, Robert Peng. Robert Peng. Sorry, Robert. Yes. Um, but <laughs> I, I apologize, Robert. Um, He'll be watching. Yeah. If you're watching, I apologize. Got your name wrong. But um, yeah. So that, and is there anything else that you're doing that helps? Mm -hmm. I know you're really good with your time. I know that's been such an important thing for you. I remember when we were in Canada, you talked very much about clear boundaries and keeping yeah. your time very much for you yeah. and mm -hmm. having these separations. So is there anything else that you're, you're currently doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Right. So, um, yeah, that's a really deep one. And I, I want to go back to what you said about having a conversation with the universe because things don't usually show up the way that you expect them. And that's sort of a grand mystery that I'm really engaged with and I actually really love. Um, but, you know, all of my best plans to have the best practices to dig down and work on my business. Um, I think that the most fundamental one that showed up for me in this conversation was um, when I when I left my hospital job behind it was like there was a need for a great unwinding an unwinding of you know two decades of structure and systems and quite literally um, a fair amount of violence um so i realized that i had been traumatized in the process of that oh no tiara I lost you. Yeah, where where did you lose me? Uh, you said there was quite a lot of violence. You're exposed to a lot of violence. Oh, wow. That was way and, back. <laughs> I went on for a long time. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah, so I was saying that, you know, even, even, even that experience, I realized that, you know, I had also endured a, a trauma. And, um, and I had to acknowledge that. And so in the unwinding of that, of that time and to really satisfy some healing around that work um i just needed to take some time and space to just be and not to be in do mode and go mode constantly um so i gave myself permission to just um spend vast quantities of time <laughs> because i had it for the first time in my life to just play and i've been um doing a lot of fun things in my environment. I'm really lucky to live on the coast. So I have access to the beach and 
you know, we've had um, a pretty mild winter here on the coast, uh, central coast of California. So um, a lot of, Cruz, is it? yes, Santa yeah. Cruz. Yeah. I Aptos, the actually. Lost Boys. I love that film. Oh, like, yes. The Lost Boys. And, and you see the, the Ferris wheel, you know. Right. right. And Santa, what do they call it? Santa Clara. Yeah. Santa Clarita or something. Oh, I can't remember. Yeah. Santa yeah. Maria or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a lot of time in the ocean. Um, I formed a small group of women that um, we do um, breathing and ice baths and circle sharing um, every week. Um, tree climbing. Tree climbing has just been like such a fabulous thing here. I'll just show you like there's this gigantic um, redwood tree Amazing. in my yard that um my son and i are actually going to go climb at three o'clock but we've been playing around with that um some functional and physical training on on the beach too there's a, a group of people that i've met out here that um build giant seesaws out of logs that are just laying on the beach and getting up there and balancing on them and dragging kettlebells along the sand and i think you've seen some of those videos yeah. so so just no. I, yeah, I remember seeing videos of you doing ice baths with Tony Flow Reel. Yes. And he's up in the Northern Ireland, I believe, last time yes, I spoke. And I believe he got married recently. He sure did. Yeah. Yes, the beautiful so Judith. There you go. So he's half Irish now. <laughs> yeah, I think she's English oh, as gosh, well. Right. And, is, and, and yeah, she's following... Um, following your path and strange she's in a strange land yeah <laughs> yeah so it'd be great to have one or both of them on your podcast as well because they're amazing yeah. people but um so i i'd say that that's really been the biggest practice of helping me learn how to settle down a little bit from it's brought on a lot of just a lot of feminine flow i have to say it's gotten me out of go mode it's gotten me into flow mode and it's it has allowed me to just give myself some forgiveness and really acknowledge that um play and entertainment and fun was a was a really missing aspect for me for a couple of decades wow. so i think this part is helping me to understand um how to share that with other people yeah isn't it amazing when like I remember being in the corporate sector before I got into this and thinking that that was the way to go. That was the way to make money and get your accrue, your assets, your house and all that. And then I started looking at the bills and I started looking at my life and, and what it was costing me to live. Mm. I started converting that into the necessary work I needed to do to cover that cost. And it came down to people. It came down to me seeing so many people in the clinic. And if I could reach that amount, which was totally reachable. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, so what I wasn't chasing the money, I was chasing the contribution. Mm. And after a couple of years, the money started to come and we were able to meet the bills and we were able to have an, a decent lifestyle where we could go on holiday and travel and, and teach and share. And this whole strange time we've been through, which my daughter won't even mention the name. She doesn't want anyone to mention the name beginning with C and ending in D. Good. Uh, good for her. So you don't give more power to it. Yeah, she's not giving power to it at all. She's brilliant. Um, but she but isn't it strange that I'm working less hours physically, but I'm maintaining still the same standard of life. Mm. And I'm able to work now with you and with other people share and contribute more because I think when you, when you step away from that, well, I call it the golden handcuffs. We've all been in a job that pays well, meets the bills, nourishes the family. Yet we want to step into the realm of something we really love and really want to do, but yeah. we're afraid of losing the golden handcuffs, you know, mm -hmm. and I call them golden handcuffs because we think that's where the, uh, prosperity and the money and the abundance is mm -hmm. but it's really the abundance we're experiencing is having i think the new currency is time is what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. time and freedom is mm -hmm. what we've come to realize is so much more important um true you know and i do feel that there is a shift in the current there is slowly a shift in the awareness 
that the old model doesn't work, this model of corporate control and, you know, loaning money from banks that don't even have the money, um, mm. the gambling on you that you will pay it back. You know, it's 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 been going on for thousands of years. And I feel that we're kind of like, for an example, we got our house without a mortgage. It's possible. You can do it. But it took us years, and I mean years and years, like 10 years maybe of trying. Now, we didn't plan that we would get a house mortgage free. It just, our manifestation, our belief, our commitment, just a constant grinding towards that goal, never giving up, not settling for anything other. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, the house has things we need to do with it, but you'll take that every single day of the week if you're living out your life as you have dreamed it. Absolutely. And I think people are realizing that that's possible. I see here in Ireland, people have left the city. They've mm. moved to the country. They're working mm. from home now. And now that Ireland's opening up, the boss is ringing them. You need to come back in. And they're like, nah, screw you, buddy. You know, I'm good. I'm damn good at my job. I've working twice as hard from home. I'm staying in County Kerry. I'm not yeah. coming to Dublin, you know? And I think there is a shift in that awareness of what's right for you. Yeah. Now, there are other people that have missed the human contact. Like we had our freedom weekend, I think it was called last weekend. And, and all my friends said it was amazing to hug and kiss. And, and everyone was, in, I mean, Irish people anyway, when they're drunk, are so happy. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you very rarely see a fight unless it's between rival families. But um, generally, it's like, you know, in England, if you bashed and boshed off someone, you could get into a bit of a row. But here it's like, ah, that's just normal. You know, to get to the bar, you have to climb on top of people, you know. Um, <laughs> but everybody's happy in doing it. Um, so there is a slight lift in morale here, which is helping. But there's also a feeling of, oh, well, I don't really want to let go of what we've actually gained because in it's that, that Taoist saying or that, you know, invest in loss, you've actually, in losing all these freedoms, you've actually gained a lot of value. And it's an indirect response. I don't think it's necessary that it was designed that way. I just think people have learned to find where their abundance is. And I don't mm -hmm. know, I mean, I know you've moved house, You've gone from where you were to this amazing, big, massive redwood home that you have standing there, big ancient tree in front of your house. Mm -hmm. And so have you seen an improvement? Have you, Or have you seen just a shift in your behavior and the way that you play now compared to when mm -hmm. you were living on the, on the, on the farm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I just want to go back a little bit and just comment on what you're talking about in terms of these people and how I fit into that reprioritization of time and, and values um, that have come up during this time. And I, I think it's part of that like great resignation, right. That, that so many people have left their, you know, careers and maybe weren't even planning on doing that. I know I wasn't in this time frame, but it really showed up for me that, um, you know, how, how tender and, and short and, and valuable our, our lives are. And that, you know, I, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here on this planet. So why, if I can do this securely and if I can do it, you know, with, you know, I mean, I, I have to say I'm greatly blessed with some resources that have allowed me to do this. Um, they took creativity to find, though. It wasn't like it was just a pile of money landed in my lap. No. Um, but that that um, shift and prioritization um, is happening all over the place here. And I'm seeing, I mean, I just got a phone call yesterday from a coworker that I worked with who was also just, you know, it, it made me feel amazing because I feel like I was really the first person in my unit that was like, mm, you know, it wasn't of retirement age exactly, but was like, you know what, I, I think I'm ready to go. Um, and she's about a decade older than me and has been there longer. And she just, I think she just wanted to speak to somebody that like 
could give her just a little bit of oomph, you know, to just take a step. And, um, and so we had this really beautiful conversation that by the end of it, she was like, oh my God, like, I don't see how I can't not do this now. Um, so just in terms of my own behavior and, um, and, and quality, um, I'm letting, I'm letting some slack out of the rope a little bit, you know, like I have a huge, um, list of goals, smart goals, benchmarks for them. You know, I've got a business coach, um, you know, I'm, I'm building more of the foundation right now, but I'm really checking in with flow to see like, how much energy do I have for this today? Like, can I just show up for my kids today in this really powerful, straight spined way that's settled and grounded and rooted at the same time that I really couldn't before? Is that a priority? Um, you know, is it, is it, is it time for like a spontaneous date night tonight? Because I can do that with my husband. Um, is it, is it time maybe to just scrub the floors, you know? So I always think of that, you know, that simple, um, saying that we, we talk about, um, eat rice, wash bowl, chop wood. And I feel like I'm just really just staying with the process. I'll set out my ideas for how the day, what I want the day to look like, but then I just kind of, I, I wipe that a little bit and soften it. And I say, okay, spirit, what's the conversation that you want to have with me? And I weave those together. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, that that that, can't, that just resonates with me at the moment. Like, you know, um, I'm not far off behind you now. And and so it's this year for me is a big year. And I'm I said some, you know, there's there's a few things that I'd like to do and uh, mainly focusing on my own health as again, so upping my training, improving my diet, which we've been doing really good on so far. And um not committing to too many things. I mean, I'm a, I'm a devil for doing 20 projects at once. Mm -hmm. And I've learned to really rein that in and really pull back uh, and just focus on and keeping the clinic ticking over and allow things to come to me a lot more. And out of the blue, I've been asked to go and teach. Out of the blue, I've been asked to collaborate with two other people who are very well respected in the field of acupuncture. And so I'm doing these collaborations for fun with no agenda, just because I enjoy their company and enjoy their teachings and we work well together. Mm. And um, I, I, even my wife said it to me the other day, we, we, because she works very hard, we don't always get a chance to have a real sort of conversation about where we're at, but yeah. we went for a conscious walk today and we said, right, we'll go for a walk up to the top of the hill and have a look and have a chat and usually she's offloading on me because her job is is a daily grind yeah. uh whereas i'm off on off on and a lot of my stuff is confidential so i don't talk about it and then i just offloaded on her today for like half an hour and it felt good and uh you know i said to her, i don't i can't remember the last time i really offloaded on you you know um and you know, I often sometimes think the stuff that I offload on her is really way out there compared mm -hmm. to what she offloads on me, but that's what makes us good partners. But she's real solid in, in organ organization, having things organized and structured. So when I reach out to her, she'll say, right, do you want me to come at this as your wife? Or do you want me to come at this as with my business analysis, senior business analysis head? And I'll yeah. say, okay, like I think today I need you to come at it from the business side of things, or I think you need to come at it from the wife thing. Erin, she'll so she'll give me what she feels, um, and she's really good at at you know pointing out where I'm too quick to judge and holding me accountable for my thoughts. So mm. we we work great that way, but um, I do still drive her crazy, which is with all my madcap uh, ideas. But I think that's the problem with your entrepreneur. You know, you can have a thousand good ideas and it takes a thousand before you find one good one. Right. But I've really been working a lot with the human design, you know, this human design thing and the gene. Yeah. Thing. 
I'm really trying to play to my design, which is allowing things to come to manifest. And that takes a lot of internal patience. But uh, yeah, I would like You're so to- lucky to have Chief. Like, it's yeah. wonderful to have that partner that can absorb all of that <laughs> and ground it for you. I t- and- I've brought it to the breaking point a few times where she's yeah. gone, right, I'm packing my bags, <laughs> you know. But she, I just say, okay, what do I need to do to, to make, make this? stay stay where we are and then Mm. i just it's pulling back on my behavior if i pull back and and bring the focus back in and what's really really important she's really good at showing me what's really important and it's family Mm. you know and it's the kids Mm. and it's the home Mm. and have that as number one priority and everything else can work around and Mm -hmm. it's working better for us you know that's so Um, great whereas if i was let i'm a sagittarius way if i was just let go I'd be around the world 12 times backwards, naked, covered in axle grease, going hell for leather with vodka flowing through my veins. I would just go mad, not so I have to be, I have to have that accountability to say, like, you know, just flow a little bit more, pull back, ground yourself. So she grounds me when the Qigong isn't grounding me, if you know what I mean. Yes, I do. Very much so. Yeah, and that's a that's a powerful thing around, um, you know, polarity, right? And the feminine and masculine, and what we can actually do for each other, and and kind of knowing your strengths in that, and and knowing how to play one or the other in terms of of what's needed um, in that situation. And I know that my husband um, is also a little nuts with me and we're kind of the double entrepreneur team where you know he has as many ideas as i do so we both get it um at times going back and forth with each other um but i have to say for me he um he holds such a like a strong structured presence with me um to just listen he's just such an amazing listener he uses all of the Chinese character of listening, you know, just really treating you with like the utmost attention and using his, you know, his, his eyes and his heart facing you, like all of the characters, um, aspects and will let me, like you said, unload, um, and then somehow like refines it or, or, um, God, what's that, the term that you use in, um, uh, acupuncture, like consolidates it somehow for me and, um, and kind of spits it back out to say, Hey, is this right? You know? And I'm like, Oh my God, you know, (laughs) thank you for processing and digesting and chewing down all of that and, and showing me some of the essence back. Um, and he's been invaluable in, um, partnering side by side with me to develop a, a course, um, for, pregnant families and, and, and really raising the bar for what, um, what, what fathers, um, may potentially need to hear to, to show up for, um, for their pregnant partners, for their, you know, wives or, um, girlfriends or wherever their relationship stands and bring that richness into it. So it really is like a family experience and, and in doing so, um, there's that growth and that, um, ability to see, themselves as well. They kind of have these terms, you know, I said birthing ourselves. So there's this idea of matrescence, which is the becoming of a mother. There's also the other polar side of that, which is patrescence. It's like, let's pay attention on what it means to become a father and what's your role? What do you do? I mean, it's not really taught. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's been a lot of richness and value through us having these three children together for, um, you know, what he sees as sort of a masculine, but balanced masculine role to support like this, you know, amazing expression of this part of life. I think it's so important because, you know, regardless of where you stand in your sexuality, your binary, non-binary, all these things that I don't even understand, but um, it's it's so important that the lines don't get too blurred because I feel like a little bit like my hand is doing this now and that, <laughs> you know, what the hell is going on with the world? The vibration is becoming too blurred and it's nice yeah. occasionally to have that structure and say like, okay, 
you know, I know that roles can be interchangeable, right? So I can see sure. like my wife taking on that masculine energy sure. and, and me taking it on. And then it's like a tennis match, but you know, like at the moment we're going through a bit of a thing at home where, um, we're trying to deal with a teenager who's growing really tall and is, is constantly giving back chat, you know, and none of it's highly offensive, but it's a constant stream of, he knows the answers. He knows how the world works. He, he, he knows it all. And it's, you know, wow, b- back in my day, it was like, you know, you couldn't do that. It was you get backhanded um, no, for that. No, yeah, you, you just be, <laughs> you know, yeah, forget it. Like you'd be locked away in your room for a month, you know? So, yeah. uh, but it's different now because they, they know more about the world. They do, you know, uh, mm-hmm. they know more about how the world works in some ways. And then in other ways they have n- sometimes zero common sense. Oh uh, yeah. Like they don't even know how to use a dishwasher or a washing machine or make a proper phone call. Yeah. Like how, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like, what? you know <laughs> you know how how do i make how do i boil an egg it's like you're joking me you know <laughs> we were like doing campfires when we were eight years old and cooking rashes and sausages and you know we, we were all doing that at eight you know so yeah. it's like they've yeah there's a lot to everything's just you push a button and you get it you know so right. uh it's interesting to see that i mean Thinking about what you said, actually, I must send you a video after this of a guy okay. who spent three years. I don't know if he's out your way, but he spent three years living like a primal man. Uh huh. And now I'm saying he probably had a lot of help and editing and filming and stuff, but it's it's the level of grind and work. You can see why we made tools and why we've got to where we were. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but you can see how much we've lost connection yeah. with that tribal element. So I was saying to a lot, you know, a lot of my clients, especially I, I, I treat a lot of women, mid thirties, early forties, primary and secondary fertility issues. And, you know, they end up having children, hopefully. And then it's the, the shock to the system of this, this child that is is omnipotent is all demanding and you know doesn't give you a minute to rest and they're like in this complete shell shock you know mm. and um i said you know in the past you would have lived in a tribe you would have been in a hut or a shelter or in a cave with multiple men and women around you yeah. They could literally lift that child up and nourish it and yep. care for it and give you time to rest and come back. And and so that child was constantly surrounded by adults and adult interaction and constantly learning um, and probably had a lot more freedom because felt very safe. Now we're right. giving birth to these children in a box, you know, in boxes, in little buildings, bringing them home to buildings, living in buildings with them and, you fr- frightened to bring them out in case somebody steals them. And, and then, you know, it's like all this lack of interaction. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously there are some families that are different. Like my wife's mother is one of 17 and they lived wow. in a house the size of my man cave here, which is not very big. So, you know, different circumstances, but I'm talking about sort of the more privileged people in yep. society, you know, um, and I really do see a value, you know, especially when you like there's one couple I remember many years ago treating and, you know, it's like the, the, the woman would take out a book. I think it was like Miriam Stoppard or something like that and be reading mm-hmm. through the what to do, how to this, if the baby cries that you go to this. And then if this happens, you, you know, it was like a project, you know, mm-hmm. And the dad would just kind of stand around and like with his hands in his pockets, just kind of walk around looking shifty, like, oh, what do I do now? Or oh, uh, I'll go and check the heating or, uh, yeah, I'm just going to go outside to the shed and make sure that the, the, the lawnmower works. And it was like, you know, there's none of this intuitive power. It's all gone. It's all yeah. just like instruction manual looking after babies. Yeah. Um, and I think I kind of blame that a little bit on the medical system, to be honest with you. 
Mm-hmm. I think they wrote all these expert, all these experts wrote all these books on how your child should be, you know, wow. how big it should be and how it should grow. And, you know, obviously there's developmental milestones that would you'd be worried about, but another example is a lady I treated who is extremely fit, strong, healthy, very light build. Her baby was like very, very small compared to all the other women in her circle. And yet the baby's strong, healthy, fit, wiry, is developmenting faster and moving faster. And, you know, because it's not a big, fat, chubby baby, you know, because in <laughs> Ireland we give birth to big, big, plump babies because we live in a dairy farm lifestyle, you know, whereas this lady lived in sort of a non-dairy lifestyle and ate a different diet. So her baby's mm-hmm. going to look different. Yeah. Because it didn't fit the norm. Oh my God, baby's unhealthy, you know? Uh-huh. Yep. And it's it's helping people realize it's okay. You know, um, as long as you feel the intuitive with your child that they're happy, they're healthy, they're nourished, they're warming yeah. to you, you know, they're interacting yeah. with you, they're moving, they're communicating. Yeah. I mean, how, yeah. do we, how do we, where do we get, how do we get there with these people? What's your <laughs> we get strategy? There. Yes. Yeah. So you're just speaking my language right now in terms of like what I feel like is so, so important. So I'm kind of, I'm in the midst of like embryonically pulling together a postpartum program that is based on a a wheel where the mother is at the hub of the wheel and then she has at least 10 caregivers within her circle that are actually pulling the weight for her because I believe in a nurtured world where moms can be at the center of care and they need to actually own and center their own care through that. But if she is uh, multiply responsible for not only just caring for the child, but for making, you know, all the appointments to, you know, seek this external care you're talking about and to make all the appointments for herself to heal and get well, as well as, you know, appoint the people that are, you know, maybe going to make her meals and, you know, put this whole system together. I'm, you know, and a lot of times people do that and plan on that, you know, during pregnancy, it's great, but we sort of need to reverse engineer this way of looking at it and kind of know that, you know, when you've got somebody that's going to be having a baby within your community, that there's a circle up around them and starting to teach this idea so that moms also have that job of letting go of control, which a lot of them have some issues with that too. Like it's not going to be quite right for them or somebody's going to make the wrong food or somebody won't hold the baby properly. So that's, I always think about that spleen deficiency with you where there's like this hyper vigilant state that these mamas get into and it's kind of a real vicious circle. So tending to hearth and home, staying warm, being tended to, we need to have, um, you know, our wise grandmas or our, you know, second mothers, or, you know, we need to have these wise women around these child mothers. I, I say that because it's kind of like, it's their first go about, right. It's like, they don't know what, I mean, they have an idea, but they don't understand the intensity of the nuclear family and bringing up a child within that. Um, And so we need to have these teachers around her so that she can nurture, she can be nurtured to nurture her own baby Um, and not have these um, senses of accomplishment. Like, oh, I still need to be a good wife and I've got to attend to that. And I've got to attend to making sure that I'm like the perfect mom. And I fit all of my ideals for what I thought was going to be the way that I should be based on probably my own mothering experience, plus a lot of societal programming. Um, And then, you know, and then falling short of that and then having shame, you know, it just kind of has this whole snowball effect to it. So, um, so what I see is, is, you know, having, um, you know, this, this wheel where mom is at the hub and not only does that, you know, give her the grace to be able to develop 
her own mothering instinct instincts and get in touch with those and tend to hearth and home, which is going to be so strong for the spleen and having her feel just centered and solid and warm and secure, um, that she, um, may also, um, have this child, like you're saying in the tribe where like this child's just like carried all the time, this child's cared for all the time. This child's never sat down because there's just like a moment of, of, you know, arm resting that the mom may need if the baby's crying all the time or whatever it is. Um, this child is brought up within this environment that is just so nurtured and so understood and so, um, so profound for how we all need to start, you know? So, um, hi Liam, child number two showing up. It wasn't. <laughs> I was thinking like, is there a program you might think of doing as for you know people like my wife or you know where we we get into that how do you nurture yourself as the children grow with you yeah um, i mean i'm thinking you know like i would have had a sister she didn't she didn't survive uh very early on she, 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 it's a long story but so mm -hmm. i'm technically child number two um all my uncles on my mom's side and uncles on my dad's side all had boy girl or girl boy um and that's been the, the family pattern so in that way i can see like scott and abby are very close right they're very close now they fight their brother and sister now because he's a bit older abby looks up to him and and it's quite interesting even though they know each other he'll always ask like where is she where's abby what's she doing where's abby gone so there's still a very strong connection and i, I like to test that connection so Sometimes what I do is I'll pretend I'm having a play fight with Scott and then I'll pretend that I'm beating him up, you know, like I'm not really doing anything, but I'm on top of him and giving him like, Oh, I've got him. I've got him now. And Abby will rise up and start like going at me, like get off my brother. Like, and it's like, wow, this is the person who you hate, but you will rise to defend him. It's, you know, cause I've never experienced that because yeah. I've always been the only child. I've never had yeah. that. It's nice to see, I said that the love is is very deep. It's at a it's at a it's at a an etheric level, you know. Um, mm. But I'm always I always think to my wife with my wife. She, you know, uh, Abby's the creative fairy, alien, dust angel. You know, <laughs> <clears throat> she always has a smile. She's always happy. Um, she's completely nav navigated this whole C nineteen thing like pff, water off a duck's back uh, scott has suffered a bit more he's a bit more internal a bit more you know sensitive um but has has risen to the challenge in school now and is, is really doing really really great things and but you still worry they're always going to be your children when they're in the 20s and 30s like oh, i had a yeah. conversation like i'm nearly 50 and a conversation with mom this morning and I woke up and I just put the phone on and I'm lying in bed and, and I she turned on the phone and she's lying in bed. I said, oh, we're both lying in bed this morning having this conversation. And uh, she still, oh, you know, oh, she still worries like, oh, be careful. Oh, you know, don't do that sunshine and oh, be careful and be careful what you do. And it's like, it hasn't changed, you know, uh, yeah. that, yeah. that, that spleen chi deficiency is still very strong. And, uh, you know, I, I've, people don't know what spleen chi deficiency is, then it's kind of a bit of a, it's actually a bit of a joke in Chinese medicine because you could say that most people have spleen chi deficiency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they worry and there's a, a level of anxiety there, perpetual thinking and ruminating over the same problems over and over again. But um, yeah, so I'm wondering, we've gone from nursing ourselves to birthing ourselves. And are you, mm -hmm. are you delivering that platform online or face to face mm -hmm. or yeah. are you doing both yeah. or what is it? Yeah, both. Happen? Yeah. We had definitely a slowdown this winter, you know, with being able to meet up and people were not as interested in meeting in person. Um, I taught live my last in-person group in November, which all of those babies came now. Um, but, um, yeah, so I have a zoom, um, a zoom group. Um, and next one is starting in, oh gosh, I have to check the calendar. I should have known this. I want to say it's mid February okay. or maybe, maybe the end of February, but, um, yeah. So, um, 
rebirthingourselves.com. I have my online calendar there for, for signing up for Zoom. But I also have a, a teachable platform where people can self-pace. And that course goes up um, every six weeks or so. So I can run the same group or a group of connected people together Mm -hmm. and then show up to like webinar once or twice throughout that group. So there's still some connection and collaboration. You're not totally on your own. And, and then it leaves the pressure off. It's just like, Oh yeah, well, I'm supposed to be doing this thing in six weeks, but I can't really keep up with that flow or I've really shirked it. And I've only done one module or just listened to the intro they can still show up and ask questions and feel like they're part of something and that they can kind of look at what's important to them in that curriculum and, and pick and choose what they want to watch and what they want to engage with and what they want to learn. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking that, you know, there's def- I mean, I know I wanted you to come over to Ireland and we had all these plans and <laughs> happened. I'm still I, coming. It's just yeah, a matter of when. Yeah, I'm still in contact with uh, Sinead uh, and she's, her Sinead Thompson is it was a quite a famous midwife uh, in Dublin, and she worked in a team of people that worked in the community, and you know, uh, with Hollow Street, which was uh, is the most famous maternity hospital next to the Rotunda, of course, which is apparently the oldest maternity hospital in the whole of Europe. Wow! So there's a rich history of midwifery and nursing. In Ireland, and in fact, I think I was even delivered by Catholic nuns in South Africa when I was a baby. So, nice, you know, go figure. So, um, yeah, it's it's um, it's one of these things where I see how she's progressed. You know, I remember treating her, and she she'll tell you she's out in the battlefield for years. I mean, for years. I mean, uh, I don't know how long I've known her, but many, many, many years, and seen her progress and change. And then I kind of knew maybe 10 years ago, I had a feeling I said, I think I see you on the stage talking and sharing your work. And of course she's getting there now. She's, she's out there. She's got her system. And, uh, that's in every maternity hospital in Ireland. Now they have this system that she's developed and it won't be long. I'd say before she's on lecturing and teaching and Mm -hmm. the way she's going. And I'm glad for her because it's hard when you're doing those shifts and it's six days on and three days off wow. and four days on and three days. You don't know where you are in the middle of the night. Yeah. You're doubling up and delivering, you know, God knows, I mean, how many babies she's delivered. Her, like her yep. right arm is is completely worn out from pulling babies. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's incredible. But I, mean, she, I hope she doesn't mind me talking about this, Sinead. I know you'll be listening in. But, oh, so. her system is amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's Hopscotch so simple and straightforward. Yeah. Called. Yeah. Labor hopscotch. Um, I would love also for her to come to America because it's just totally right up like U.S. and their alley and the way that they look at things. So like strategically, like step by step is very logical, but it also makes a lot of sense just to kind of flow through movement. And, you know, you can skip and jump from like, you know, step three, one to three to seven, and then go back to two. You don't have to make it totally sequenced, but um, I I think it's really straightforward and it gets people out of bed, which is a major Mm -hmm major problem in the hospitals um, for women laboring is, you know, they feel somehow psychically um, because just because of policy and procedures tied to the bed that they have to be there, you know, whereas really the bed should just be like out of the room (laughs) and labor off scotch was sort of that. Yeah. The birthing difference between one and two was, was like millennial difference. You know, it was like the Mm. first one was all so controlled. And mm-hmm. the second one, there was more active movement, all fours. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to do the birthing pool because there was a history of various issues in the hospital at the time. So we had to be careful. But uh, yeah, I, I have mm-hmm. a friend who I actually teach and he was telling me, you know, they they did the birthing at home and they did it all in secret and nobody knew. They didn't tell anyone because things where yep. the eyes were so tight on people, you know, you can, can't be doing that in Ireland, birthing at home. What, what kind of lunatic are you? You know, I just had a, a client deliver yesterday. There at, you go. Yeah. Yeah. I had a client that delivered yesterday. There's a whole concept of free birth. I don't know if it's, you know, well known in Ireland or not, but um, mm. that, you know, that not only are people, 
rejecting the structure of the hospital and the confines of that system, but also rejecting that, you know, even being attended at home with a midwife is something that's, um, you know, just considered of whether or not that that person is really going to step in and um, contribute to like vital energy that's going to bring forth this child, or if they're going to be inhibited in some sort, because, you know, our nervous systems are just that sensitive, right? The energy of someone just coming into a space can just make it or break it, shut it all down, um, contract, you know, the, the opening or the energy or, or the flow or being able to just really let the oxytocin take over and not feel like you have any adrenaline running, which is totally subconscious. It's not something that you can pick up, but, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so she just delivered, she, she had me sort of on her call list that if they ran into any specific troubles that I could help with, um, I was supposed to come and she sent me a text. She's like, it went beautiful. We had our baby this morning. It was amazing. Thanks for being available. So it was really, <laughs> really awesome. cool to hear that. I remember treating a lady about 10 years ago and she, I can't remember which country she was from. I'm going to say it was something like Serbia, but um, I can't remember. I think it was Serbia. And she was very direct woman. You know, I come here, I hear you good. You help me get baby out. I was like, okay, I will try. <laughs> uh, no guarantees. <laughs> so anyway, we, um, we treated her anyway. And, and about, I think it was three or four treatments in, it was for a natural induction and then I get a text message at 4 a.m. Okay, you come to hospital now and help me get baby out. And I was like, oh, I'm an acupuncturist, <laughs> not a midwife or uh, whatever the male version equivalent is. Oh, but, my gosh. And it was like, then she started ringing me. No, you need to come now. People, you need to be here for the baby. And I'm like, oh, gee. Yeah. So it's like, you know, obviously in her culture, that's a barrier. what you did, you know, it was lost in a barrier. Like yeah. you treated me. So now you need to come and meet the baby, which I, oh, you know, wow. I had to kind of explain to her that, you know, I'm at home with my own child who's teething. Um, so yeah, it was kind of interesting, the cultural differences that can, but I never forget my son when he was born, he was delivered by a Hungarian girl and she was amazing. She was like, right let's go she was like we're in a soccer match let's get this baby out whoa it was like whoa. it was a complete energy shift from from the irish midwife you know but it was good it was what was needed um yeah but i i don't know if you've ever heard of yehudi gordon if you haven't check him out he's he's retired okay. now he must be in his yehudi gordon i'll send you a link he was super famous i mean he's I mean, a little bit controversial, I think, in his day, but he was well ahead of his time in the 80s, 70s. Uh -huh. And he had his own birthing center, which I think closed in the 90s in London. It was like a multi-story, multidisciplinary. You went, you came and you stayed there and it was all natural, all natural approaches. And I think he's still, he's still alive as far as I'm aware. And he's now, yeah. I think he's working on his own health now. He's He's realized years and years of writing and being an academic after closing the center. He's now gone to barefoot walking and he's hanging off a bar and he's primal squatting. And he's, he said he's like hanging off the bars on the underground. So when he's on the tra tram, he's like hanging off the bar and everyone's looking at him. And then he goes down into a squat. So he's gone from this like doctor role into this natural living mode and it's transformed his, wow. health, his back and his spine from years of delivery. So I think the message is here, no matter what you've been doing as a midwife, a nurse, a doctor, a medic, a non-medic, a lady giving birth, a lady carrying babies, a lady about to give birth, a lady about to conceive, there needs to be something there to nourish ourselves, to become part of a tribe, Absolutely. to reach out to people that can yes. help you in a similar position and not be become a medical subject. And I blame the French and I hope the French aren't too offended by my, <laughs> you know, cause I love French food, but there was certain, I believe some, it was a King Louis the 14th. He demanded that women give birth uh -huh. on their backs. So you can blame him um, for that, okay. that whole phenomenon. Apparently now, if anyone's watching this and can correct me on that fact, please correct me. But I'm pretty sure it was one of the, the French Kings that, um, decided he wanted to see the birth and he couldn't see it properly. So 
women have to lie on their back. And it became like a medical thing. Like that's how women should deliver lying on their back. Um, we know, and you right. know, and I know anatomically speaking, that's <laughs> probably one of the worst ways you can deliver unless it pop. is but just to dispel a myth really quick there are moments for it yes. even in a natural setting to like explore all positions yes, and to see what's working for you yes. and to really connect with like where does the body want to go and sure. sometimes you know like i have no judgment but you know we have a really pretty high epidural um rate here in the united states it's up in the 70 to 80 percent and not that an epidural precludes delivering in that lithotomy position but um you want to really range through all the kind of non foot bear foot weight bearing positions and and sometimes that'll actually give you the widest pelvis is to actually be pretty low and flat so that um you know it will it will sometimes create space um sometimes sitting and having flexed hips actually can create like a, a smaller space so if you can kind of do either leaning forward anyways just dispelling that like there's no bad position it's just that if you're in that position all the time um yeah, that's the uh, point i was making then, is then you're really not yeah then you're probably inhibiting the yeah. the, the progress of it's the not a baby coming for to all. you it's not a panacea for all you, you know yeah i'd really love yeah. to see what will happen in the next few thousand years where the men will be have the ability to give birth and then women can go oh <laughs> 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 yeah good luck uh, i would say to my yeah, clients if more, it was up more to, power men, to think, them if it was up to men to give birth, I think the total population would be eight, and not eight billion. <laughs> it just would be eight. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I mean, just coming from my own perspective, you know, of you know, cisgender woman, you know, I, you know, have a male partner, and um, you know, it's it's really interesting to to see the individual stories of of people like you know really humans birthing over over women birthing not over but in addition to um and, and there's some really interesting stories out there um but giving that really like that that primary focus to not forget women's role that actually like women are the primary deliverers of babies and not to have that co-opted or taken away from us. I think that's mm. really, really important. Super important. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was studying at university, no, actually prior to university, I went to what's called a tertiary college. So you're like 16 to 19 and we had an RGN, um, registered general nurse as a lecturer. And she was, how can I say, not the best with men. Uh, um, mm. And uh, there was four guys on the course and like 20 girls, which was great. And um, anyway, and she said, right, and we're going to send the men out into the battlefield. And uh, she, she, I think when we got to 18, we were allowed to go to a uh, maternity ward and we witnessed like, I think I witnessed 50 births or something over a period of time. Wow. And um the, the three lads that were with me, they all went green and fell on the floor. And I just had this fascination with like, I'd be like, oh, wow, man, how does that work? Like, yeah. Like, like, and, and you yeah. can see the midwife's like, are you not gassing out on this? Are you not like, and like, no. And I, and I don't know why that is, you know? And then I realized I had, I had a fascination with the human body. Absolutely. You know, just, Curious uh, mind. The, cu the curiosity. And then watching how really how a C-section is, is works and, and then seeing all the different, there are actually multiple ways of doing a C-section and it's like, Oh wow. Okay. And you know, and, and, and I came back like, yeah, it was great. And the other lads were like, never again, never again. And then she made an admission <laughs> to try to really push me to my absolute limit and, and put me in all these different weird zones, but I was all right with it. And I think I drew the line. I can't remember what it was. Uh, I, I don't know if it was. Yeah, I think it was like when we got into proctology or something. I was like, okay, yeah, I draw the line now. <laughs> I've reached my limit now. I don't want to be looking at people's bombs now. So, but it was like you know when I got to university, then it was a little bit more sterile and controlled, and you know mm -hmm. in labs and and it, all stats and figures and stuff. So that was a lot easier to cope with. But I remember working in hospitals and and. 
you know, seeing a dead body for the first time, like proper yeah. sort of like somebody yeah. exhaling their last breath. And it's yeah. quite a phenomenal feeling. And you can feel the whole room just change energy, like, like a vacuum as the person leaves the soul, leaves the body. It's an phenomenal energy. And uh, then this complete silence, this complete emptiness. Um, so, yeah. And, and then, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I remember being in China then and working in a tween our department or being actually my teacher was with me. So go over there and work with this doctor. And he asked me like, what do you do? And I explained, and he, he said, Oh, do you do tween on pregnant women? So oh, yeah, I do tween on pregnant women. Tween is a physical therapy of China. It's like a medicine for them. It's like a, a combination of multiple techniques, hands-on techniques. And um, he shook my hand and he said, oh, you, you're, you're now my brother. And I was like, why? He said, because we could never do that in China. We'd never be allowed to do tween art on pregnant women. It's, it's almost forbidden. Like women are like the precious thing. Don't touch them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I do. So the point of the whole thing was, I remember in my training, this lady telling me that because a engineer created the concept of forceps, and because he was a doctor of engineering, therefore it was something that was shared with doctors, i.e. doctors of medicine, and they were the only people privy and party to be able to use this instrument because it was engineered as a medical device. Therefore, if you were a midwife or a doula, you were not trained to a medical standard to be able to use the forceps. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. then became the tipping point of, uh, should I say, downgrading the female importance roles in delivering and upgrading the, at that time, male-dominated profession. I don't think it is mm -hmm. anymore. Um, yeah, and it was like, you know, what can I say? And, it, and through both, but the, both deliveries, when there was a problem, it was a man that came in and stitched up the woman, you know. I know mm -hmm. it's different now. It's different now. But, it, you know, mm -hmm. at that time. Um, and so I Playing felt- hero. Yeah, it's like come in and yeah, look at me. I'm the on top of the tree, and I don't think it was ever designed to be that way. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, there's. I, I was listening to a story today, and somebody said, if it doesn't ring true, and you're not quite sure if that's the truth, then follow the money. Yeah, follow yeah, where the money totally. is. Totally. And then I realized, ah, oh, medical devices, medical instruments, fontus, yep. forceps. Yep. Oh, oxytocin. Oh, okay. Gas and air. Wow. You want to see there's the not, billions. Yeah, there's no billions. money to be made in the ancient wisdom of, you know, the <laughs> McRoberts position or, um, you know, just all these, you know, amazing positions that you actually can put women in to like open several of the gates within the pelvis. I mean, there's just the art of that actually it's, it's coming back now, but there's a, the full training around we're missing the pieces of trying to kind of like mechanically force this baby out when there's a dynam dynamism there with two people working together. So mm -hmm. if you can support and try out these different things before going to these, like, I'm going to say, violent measures, um, to remove a baby from a mother, um, <clears throat> then, you know, there's no money making in that. Um, you know, there's no following, um, you know, that ancient history, a lot of which we've lost in the, you know, just physiologic delivery of, of humans out of humans. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was here in Ireland, I don't know if it's still happening because of everything that's been going on, but we had a, we had an influx of foreign nationals come in, refugees, different different walks of life, fleeing war and starvation and various other things. And they were literally used to having their children at home or weren't used to being medicalized perhaps in their own culture. And they literally right. would just walk into the hospital and go, oh, I'm having a baby now. And yep. the midwives are like, well, who are you? You're not on the system. Where are you from? And and then it was like this big mad rust because they didn't have all the pre 
pre-existing stats and the blood pressure and have they been checked mm-hmm. for diabetes, STDs, HIV, right. that had been done. And then it's like the pressure went on the, on, on the birth system then because there was this procedure in place. Uh, and yet I thought, well, you know what? If that woman was in labor in the back of a taxi cab, you wouldn't ask those questions. You just go, <laughs> let's get stuck in there and get the baby out, you know, but we've become, and I feel sorry for them. I mean, I've treated hundreds and hundreds of nurses, midwives, EMTs, Garda, which is the Irish police force. And the amount of paperwork they are suffocating on the, is just atrocious. And then right. when they'd only just got used to the paperwork, they made them all go paperless because of a thing called GDPR, which is a data protection requirement. So then they ought to go to computers and laptops with special mm-hmm. passwords and passcodes and pass keys and key codes and lock things and blah, blah, blah. And can you imagine you're in the middle of a, I don't know, a home visit with a woman who's can't breastfeed properly or whatever. And you know, oh, hold on a minute. I just have to go into the laptop. Oh crap. The password doesn't work. Oh, have you got a Wi-Fi log in there? You're like, that's the last thing right. a mother wants to experience. It's like, get yeah. in there. Like I make a conscious decision. I know it's different for me because I don't have the volume, but I make a conscious decision not to do all the paperwork in the presence of the client, I'll do it afterwards or I'll put it on my computer yep. or whatever. Because in the past, they take loads of notes. And, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, and take that off and do these charts and then do the pulse and take the charts. But I yep. thought, you know, I'm acting like all the other people or what other people do. You should just interact, get the feedback, right. figure it out, write it down. Yeah, you know? totally. Um, yeah, it just, brings, it just brings to mind the, um, you know, to me, like the three treasures of – the Dowdy Jing, you know, um, simplicity, keeping your practice and your, your work with your patients is like straightforward as possible, easy, focus on what's really important, take the time and the patience is there with the time and like everything in nature, everything in nature takes its own course. And it's often way longer than we think it should be. Um, and so, because we're in this factory system, right? Like if things have to kind of move along the conveyor belt and have happened certain things at certain times like that really needs to be challenged and worked with. And then as the provider to have that compassion, like not just the compassion for your patient, but the, the self-compassion, of what work you're doing, how hard it's been in the last couple of years. And also, you know, like you're talking about with Sinead or these other midwives or nurses that you've contacted, it's just like they grind over years and years and years. And to, you know, not, you know, devalue yourself for any of the work that you've done, but just to keep that steady effort going towards taking care of yourself, improving your practice, and maybe checking in with whether or not it's your time to start teaching the teachers, Um, you know, um, building, you know, your practices into a legacy so that they can be passed on. um, And so that we can all learn from what your experience was. Um, And I think that that's something that I'm, I'm kind of, you know, rolling into, to my practice and in my business now is, is trying to keep those three treasures straight Mm -hmm. and um, make use of them um, in a really deep and profound way by practicing them myself first and then sharing them. I think at that point we should end the podcast because I think that nugget of wisdom has really sealed the deal. Is there any other messages (laughs) we can give? The audience here in Ireland and elsewhere, is there anything else you want to share with people before? Well, um, yeah, so I have a free birthing course. Um, So if you have a pregnant friend or family member or you yourself are pregnant or interested in some um, mindfulness aspects of um, pregnancy, labor, and postpartum, um, you know, we can maybe put a link in there, but it's... um, <clears throat> birthing dash ourselves dot teachable um we'll dot put com. The link, i'll put the link below yeah the, put the yeah so that's a free course 
And that leads you to, um, you know, individual coaching sessions with me. I really love to do one-on-ones with people to just, you know, help them sort through all the chaos and, you know, really figure out what's important to them. Absolutely. I mean, I have to say to everyone, if you want to reach out to somebody who's really wise and knows their stuff, this is the lady that (laughs) is changing, changing people's lives one step at a time. But within the parameters of nourishing herself as well, not just, you know, I mean, we do get, we do get that nourishment back, don't we? We do get something back. We don't just do this for money or to build prosperity or wealth or abundance. We're doing this because we feel something comes back to us. You know, I always Mm -hmm. felt that. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that, and it's looking very positive, that we get to meet up, that I get to travel the distance at least to to that side of the world and uh, and hang out and go to the beach and swing some kettlebells and maybe even brave an <laughs> ice bath. I'm not really sure about this. Uh, I've been watching a lot of Wim Hof method. I'm thinking, I don't know this whole ice bath thing. <laughs> can't be good. Can't be that good. But there's so many people in Ireland that sea swimming. It's phenomenal, including the midwives and the nurses. They're all sea swimming now. They're all Powerful. running and sea swimming. And they're doing what they supposed, should have been doing pre this, but they just didn't have the time because they were so bloody burnt out. So right. let's go Great to the families. That- the mothers, the babies, the babies of the babies, the mothers of the babies and the babies of the mothers and reach out to Tierra and the, at least try the free course anyway. I mean, there's yeah. no harm in doing that and then no. progress your knowledge with her together. And it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so Anthony. much. I know I've been bugging you for about six months to do this, but anyway. I'm so glad we, we got- just went for it. <laughs> so Ciao for now and hopefully see you in the next one. Thank you. Okay. Take care, everyone.